Hello, my name is Andrew Gija, and I'll be giving this talk on interpretations based on Takabuchi's hair. I'm a lead author and main instigator of the research was Dr. Natalie McCreesh, shown here. Unfortunately, she's not able to give this presentation, uh, so you got me. Some of the work has already been published, and here are two key papers if you want to follow up how she's used the interpretations to get insights into mummification procedures. Okay, right at the beginning, what are the problems that we have to face? The first one is time. It's about 2,000 years since the death of Takabuti to the present day, and the transfer to, first of all, Belfast, and then to the University of Manchester for interpretations at 2000. In that period of time, a lot of things could have happened to the mummy. We have to try and interpret when a particular optical property was developed and when a particular chemical composition was introduced or inferred. Secondly, we need to try and keep our analyses non-destructive. So we analyse something and then we can return it to the museum. We may have the best instrumentation nowadays, but in a hundred years time it would be much better. And if we use up all the sample now, the future will be rather lean. So we try and keep things nowadays as non-destructive as possible. Why study here? Two reasons. First of all, it's a relatively stable proteinaceous polymer, keratin, same as fingernails, toenails, etc. So while after death, soft part tissues can decay quite quickly, we have the, this polymer persisting. And the fact that we can still see hair from on a mummy 2000 years old verifies the stability. But secondly, it has a complex physical structure not just chemical, but physical. Within a single hair, there are several parts. And we can use those different parts to get different bits of information. Okay, so here's an idealized section of a single strand of hair. We start on the right, on the outside, we have the cuticle. And notice that it appears to be scales. Those scales, their size and pattern, is diagnostic of the mammal from which they were derived. And so we have a chance of identifying human hair and differentiating it from, for example, mouse hair or cat hair, which might have been present at the time of embalming. This then encloses the cortex. And the cortex itself is made up of various uh, filaments. These filaments are too small for us to use in this study. We, need, we would have used up a lot more hair destructively to interpret those. So this talk is based on the cuticle and one particular property of the cortex is colour. Right, when were the events that could have affected the mummy? 2010 current analyses. The mummy was unwrapped in 1835. Some of the material has been exposed to air and photooxidation has occurred, changing the colour of the hair. But fortunately, we have some small locks that were boxed away for future use, and we can use those. 1987 phosphine fumigation was carried out to prevent further insect delay. Below that, I put down tobacco products, as it was the habit in some museums to permit people to smoke their cigars and pipes while looking at samples. An indicator of smoking is nicotine. 1835, we had the unwrapping in Belfast, and then a long period, about 2,000 years after the death and mummification of Takabuti for things to happen chief of which was destruction and invasion by beetles. And then during mummification, we would have had treatment of the mummy, 
embalming, incense, etc. And even before then, while she was alive, we could have had chemicals introduced from cosmetics and cooking, for example. So somehow we need to try and aim to undo this. OK, if we do microscopy, first of all, that's a non-destructive technique. We can examine something and return it untouched. First of all, we've got transmitted light, then reflected light, and then environmental scanning electron microscopy. So in transmitted light, the light is, is passed through the sample. In reflected light, the light is bounced off the sample. And electron microscopy used an electron beam for surface characterization. Here's the hair color today, bleached or photo oxidized. And that's probably happened since the opening of the uh, opening of the mummy in 1835. So it's quite a fast reaction. If we were to use that material, we would get false interpretations. But we're lucky in that some hair was boxed and that has preserved the colour, as you can see here. For our analyses, we use the lower loop, the big one at the bottom there. But notice, um, obvious, obvious in two samples, is the local grime. So dirt was adhering to something on the hair. If we look at those hairs under transmitted light, we get the true color. And you can see that the color is related to the image interpretation of Takabuti on the uh, cover of your book. Notice also in the picture on the left, that there are markings going roughly perpendicular to the long axis of the hair. These are the scales, and those scales are those of a human, not a rat or a cat that was lurking in the embalming studio. But they're not quite that crisp and clear, and that's because there is a coating on top of them. OK, what are interpretations of the hairs? Mainly blunt cut tips, slightly smooth in some strands, broken tips in others. Interpretation was that they've been cut relatively close to the time of death. This interpretation is from the occurrence of slightly rounded tips, since they would have been had very straight tips if it had been cut post mortem. Now, if the hair tips had been very elongated into a point, this would indicate it had not been cut for some months prior to death. Since once hair has been cut, the tips start to round and eventually elongate. Many broken hairs suggest that the tools were blunt. This is her hair under electron microscope. Two key features. First of all, you can see on the right hand side something is sort of flaking off the hair. So that's this coating that we've seen before. And underneath that, you can see the scales of the cuticle. Interpretations by Natalie are that the hair was shorter at the front than the back and was worn in a high chignon style. It being set into neat artificial curls presumably using some kind of agent. Curls were artificially created using heating instrument, but the curl was not held that position for very long without some form of fixative. The residue on the hair, which formed a smooth coating, may have been applied as a hair fixative to hold the style in place. Similar hair styling techniques have been previously reported by Natalie on mummies from the Duckley Oasis. All right, we can now do the organic analyses, but the problem is these are destructive at the moment. Reminder, the organic molecule has three pieces of information. Molecular weight, which gives rise to an empirical formula. So the molecular weight of methane is 16, given an empirical formula of CH4. The molecule has three dimensional structure, and it also has isotope ratios, depending on where the food or water or gas came from. Same empirical formula but different structures are referred to as isomers. 
And here's an example. Here we have some molecules, both have a molecular weight of 86 atomic mass units. Empirical formula of C6H14, but two different three-dimensional shapes. So identically, positively, which isomer is which, we need to separate somehow, and that's done by chromatography. We have to do two techniques always to make a firm identification of an organic molecule. So chromatography, mass spectrometry is the one that was used in this case. The problem is that the mass spectrometry is the destructive technique. We can minimize sample destruction by analyzing as little as possible, in this case at least one milligram, by heating to thermally dissolve the organics at temperatures low enough to prevent actual breaking down of the organics. The result of the chromatogram was in this example. When reading them, you usually go from left to right, most volatile to least volatile, low molecular weight left to high molecular weight on the right, and the peak area or height is proportional to concentration. So this is the, extra, the thermal desorption of Takabuti's hair. List of the compounds, main ones on the right hand side. Those marked in red are con known contaminants, mainly thalotesters, which are associated with the formation of plastics. And then we've got silicone grease. But there are a few other compounds which are worth looking at. First of all, camphor, used by ancient Egyptians as an antimicrobial agent during embalming. But that's used to the present day for all sorts of properties, uh, aromatic properties, insect repellent, embalming fluids still, and topical skin preparations. So we don't actually know when it was introduced. It could have been introduced at the time of mummification or more recently. We have the fatty acids there. Now these are fully saturated with hydrogen uh, not unsaturated. If they were recently made by organisms, they would have a shortage of hydrogen. So the interpretation is these fats are old. It could be added at the time of mummification or any time later. A special one we have is the derivative of conifer resins, dehydrobutyric acid. That could have come from incense or from pitch coating the, uh, the coffin. And then we have cholesterol, which is a ubiquitous sterol. Conclusions. Is this how she got a photo hair style during life? Since the aim of modification is to make the body resemble as closely as possible the deceased appearance when alive. Many mummies have been found with closely shaven heads and it's presumed they would have worn wigs. It's possible Takabuti also wore a traditional wig, but perhaps only for more formal occasions. The curled and styled hair we see today was an appearance she adopted for everyday wear. Having her hair arranged in this manner for burial is an indication of how she looked in daily life. Okay, so there in a nutshell, our interpretation of Natalie, of Takabuti. When we look at our problems time, microscopy is the best technique, it seems, in that we have the preservation of the protonaceous carrageen. We do see some organics, but the interpretation of when they were introduced is hard to nail down. So for looking at hair, Non-destructive analysis using microscopy is at the moment probably the better technique. It's not to ignore organic, organic chemistry as invaluable in other situations. It's just in this specific in case, it was not the best technique to use. Thank you.